Have you ever wondered how to analyze a rental property to tell if it's a good deal or if it's not a good deal? Well, in this video, I'm gonna let you look over my shoulder as I share the approach and the formulas I use to analyze a rental property. And I promise you it's gonna be so simple, you can do it on the back of a napkin, an envelope, or whatever scrap of paper you might have. In fact, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna draw on a piece of paper and show you what I mean. Give me no fancy calculators or spreadsheets in this video, and we're getting started right now. Hi, I'm Chad Carson from CoachCarson.com. I'm also the author of Retire Early with Real Estate, a best-selling book published by Bigger Pocket. If you're new here, this is a channel all about investing in real estate so you can achieve financial independence and do more of what matters. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss anything. Now I'm going to pull out a piece of paper and a pen and show you my back-of-the-envelope approach to analyzing a rental property. Okay, let's jump right in. The approach I'm going to talk to you about today is called back of the envelope analysis. So back of the envelope analysis. And so I, I promised you in the beginning that we weren't going to be talking about fancy calculators or spreadsheets. And there's not that there's anything wrong with using those. I definitely use those and we can talk about those in other videos. But I heard a quote, and I want you to guess who this is by, that really impacted me pretty early on. And it said, if you need to use a computer or a calculator to make the calculation, you shouldn't buy it. And I'll give you a hint, probably, probably the best investor of all times. All right, you guessed it, Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett, multi-billionaire investor, said if you don't, if you need to use a calculator computer to make the calculation, you shouldn't buy it. Now, why is that? Because a good deal, in his opinion, and I found it to be the same thing, if you, you should be able to approximately calculate the numbers. And if it jumps off the paper and it says, wow, this is a good deal, the numbers look really good, then you move forward. If you have to get so precise and calculate it with to the nth degree, to the you know, third decimal place, you're trying too hard to figure out if it's a good deal. It should, it should look like a good deal with approximate numbers. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. We're gonna go over some formulas, and these are good formulas that you can use, but you can be approximately right with the calculations. You don't have to get super fancy with the math. And we're gonna look at a deal from several different, different angles. And as you can remember these and calculate them over time, and you can use whatever scrap of paper you have to do the analysis. You can do this while you're in a car looking at a property. You can do it when you're back at your desk. Wherever you happen to be, this is a tool or a toolbox that you can use to analyze a deal and know if it's a good one or not. Before we jump into the formulas, I wanna take a step back and talk about what the job of these rental properties that you're gonna be analyzing actually is. So the job with a capital J, meaning why in the world are you buying a rental property in the first place? What is it going to accomplish? And I would put forward that for most of us, you know, you're watching my channel, so hopefully you are interested in financial independence. You're interested in maybe building wealth if you're just getting started or is trying to grow your wealth. But eventually, you're also interested in living off of the income. So you want to use real estate in some form or fashion, these rental properties you're buying, to actually accomplish some of these goals. And so the key question when you're analyzing a deal to keep in mind, the reason I'm taking a step back here, is that if those are your goals, how are you going to accomplish that? How are you going to do it? That's really what analyzing a deal is telling you. And so you want to always keep that in mind, keep that big picture in mind. And at least in my opinion, if you boil down analyzing deals and analyzing rental properties, it kind of comes down to two different ways they're basically going to make you money. One of those is a, a rental property can produce income. So you collect rent, you pay your expenses, and what's left over is income to you. So that's number one. And number two is that you can use the rental property to build equity. And if you look at that in another way, it's that you've heard the old expression, buy low, sell high. So essentially you're making money on the price of the property, either by buying it low right now or doing something to the property to make the price go up or just letting the price go up over time. So in all cases, you're either using the income to put in your pocket, to put in your bank account, to pay down a loan, or you're using the equity to build up over time and then eventually sell the property or refinance it. But really, these are the engines that are gonna help you accomplish your financial goals. And so I just wanna rem remind you that all of the formulas that we're gonna look at here in this video are essentially helping you measure how good a property is at either one of those. And you're gonna to want to set your own goals in both cases for these formulas. And I want you to look at these formulas is, is sort of like if, let's say you were analyzing a property and, like, and to see if the property needs repairs and you're gonna fix it up. Well, when you're going and looking at a property, you don't just look at the property from the front of the house, do you? 
You also walk inside the house. You look at the bedroom. You look at the bathrooms. You walk around the back of the house. You crawl into the crawl space or go in the basement. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We're going to look at each deal from a bunch of different angles. Not, and if you just take one of those by themselves, if you just use a cap rate or just use a 1% rule or just use buying low and a certain price, you know, that by itself is not enough. So that's what I'm going to try to share with you is my approach, this back of the envelope approach to how do you analyze income and how do you analyze equity. All right, I'm going to start by explaining some approaches to analyzing the income of a rental property. So we're going to go over something called the gross rent multiplier, the cap rate, the net income after financing, and a cash on cash return. Right now, we're going to start with the gross rent multiplier, sometimes called the GRM. If you're brand new to analyzing rental properties, gross doesn't mean disgusting. It means the total rent. So here's how this works. You use this kind of tool to, to roughly look, and this is often used on when you're analyzing a market, not necessarily a specific rental property, but I'll show you how to apply this to a rental property. But you would look at the total price or maybe the average price in a market, and then you would divide that by the total annual rent. So let me give you an example of that. Let's say you found a property that is worth or that has a value of 144000 and then you, you were able to, to look on Zillow or talk to your rental property person, and you were able to figure out that it had a $1,000 per month rent, which on an annual basis, you want to convert that to an annual number, is $12,000. So you just apply this formula. You say 144000 divided by 12,000, and I kept my math really simple on this one, is 12. So you would say that it has a gross rent multiplier of 12. Now how does that help you? That helps you in comparison to other properties. So let's say you had another property that was worth $300,000, and you were able to analyze that one and figured out that the rent was $1,250 per month. So that means it had a $15,000 annual, so yearly rent. And so the gross rent multiplier on that is 20. And so the, the value of this kind of thing is comparing one property to another or, or, more, or more commonly one market to another. And so a gross rent, uh, lower gross rent multiplier, so like 12, would be better. So the lower the number, the better. The higher the number, the, the less uh, good this property is or this market is at producing income. And so if you look at a, a you know, market analysis, often if you look at like San Francisco and some of the bigger markets, you might have a, an average gross rent multiplier in the 30s or 40s. Whereas if you look at on the opposite end of the spectrum, some of the highest cash flow markets in the country, like Detroit, for example, might have a gross rent multiplier of eight. And then a lot of the healthier markets, the ones you might want to be in, could be anywhere from 10 to, to 20. And so that, that's kind of the starting point of why you would use a gross rent multiplier. But we're analyzing specific rental properties. And so there's a specific application of this that I want to talk about called the 1% rule we take this gross rent multiplier and we, and we apply it to a specific property. And I'll go into that right now. So the 1% rule is basically a rule of thumb or a shortcut. And you typically use it when you're early on in the analysis of a property. So for example, your realtor sends you a bunch of listings and you just want to see, is this approximately a good deal? It's not going to be something you buy a property based on, I hope. You're, not, you're going to do some other anal analysis in addition to that. But let me tell you what it means. Basically, it means that the, the monthly gross rent of that property, if you want to meet the 1% rule, the monthly gross rent should be equal to or greater than 1% of the total purchase price. All right, so let me show you an example of a property that would meet the 1% rule. So let's say something rents for $2,000 per month. Your realtor sends you a deal and the property is listed for $190,000. And it's in pretty good shape. So the total purchase price also includes repairs, by the way. So it was a major fixer-upper, and you needed to put $100,000 into the property. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your all-in cost is going to be about $190,000. Is $2,000 greater or equal to 1% of $190,000? So 1%, it's always easy to figure out 1% because you just take the decimal place and you move it over two, two times. So $1,900 would be 1% 1 of $190,000. And yes... 2,000 is greater than 1,900, so it meets the 1% rule. Let's look at a property that does not meet the 1% rule. Let's, let's say you have a property that rents for that same $2,000, 
but then you could you could buy it for three hundred thousand dollars. Well, one percent of three hundred thousand is three thousand dollars, and so that's not it's actually less than. So that one does not meet the one percent rule. Now, why is this helpful? This is remember similar to the gross rent multiplier that we're just looking at the monthly gross rent. We're actually not looking at the expenses on the property and all that. So that's why it's just a starting point. But this is a really quick approximation. You saw how fast I could do that. You could be looking at a lot of properties and screen them based on whether it met the 1% rule or not. And I'll acknowledge, and this is something we can go in more depth on on another video about the 1% rule, that not all properties and not all markets are going to easily meet the 1% rule. And so you're going to need to make a decision based on all these formulas that we look at. Does it need to meet the 1% rule for you to buy the deal or not? Can it be close? Could it be like the 0.8% you know, rule? if that meets your criteria. But the, the fact is, is this is a measurement of approximately how good a property is at producing rental income. If it's better than the 1% rule, it's better at producing income. If it's not, it's not gonna produce a lot of income. So you better make some money in some other ways if it doesn't meet this rule. Once you've used the 1% rule of the gross rent multiplier to get an approximate, maybe a kind of a pre-screening of the deal, a much more in-depth and, and accurate analysis of the property is gonna be what's called a cap rate. Let me define the cap rate with a formula and then I'll explain a little bit more what it is and how you can use it. So the cap rate formula is that you take the net operating income on an annual basis, so the yearly net operating income, I'll explain what that means in a second, and you divide that by the total purchase price. And I say total again because it's not just the price that you see listed. If it needs some repairs, you've got to add some other things to it, you want to include your total price for the property. So let me explain what the net operating income is. It's essentially when you take your gross rent that we, that we talked about in the last, last part of the, the video and you subtract all of your operating expenses. So this includes your management fees, your taxes, insurance, maintenance, all of those things. And what's left over, and you actually, and I just want to emphasize, you're not taking out your, your any kind of debt payment. So no mortgage payment yet. I'll explain why in a second. But you, when you take your gross rent, you subtract all your operating expenses, you get what's called your NOI, your net operating income. And this is a really important number because if you think about it, you know, if you, if you want to compare apples to apples, like one property to another, every property has a little bit different debt, a little bit interest rate, somebody puts a different amount of down payment. So to be able to compare two properties and see the ratio of how good a property is at producing income compared to the price, that's really what this tells you. A cap rate, the way we're looking at it now, you can use cap rates in all sorts of different ways. People use them for market analysis, they use them to compare you know, a region of a market compared to another region or different types of properties. But what I'm talking about here is that you can use this as a goal to understand whether this property is good at producing income or not. So let me give you an example of how that might work. So let's say a property produces $10,000 in net operating income. And you could buy the property for $100,000 all in. You can pause this and do the math if you want to. Pretty simple math in this one. 10,000 divided by 100,000 means the cap rate is 10%. All right, so let's look at another one though. Let's say that same property only produced $5,000 per, per year. And this is an annual basis, remember. Net operating income divided by, and you could pay the same price for it, then your cap rate would be 5%. So if you've ever looked at return on investments or dividend rates or, or earnings rates in stocks, for example, it's a very similar concept here you're basically looking at what's that ratio? What, what kind of return could I get if I just paid all cash for it? I didn't have any debt on the property. And I find it very useful because it always reminds me of the opportunity cost of what I'm doing investing in this property. When you start involving debt and down payments and cash on cash returns, something we're gonna talk about here in a second, then it gets a little messy. You can, you can play some games with this, but it's hard to play games when you look at how good a property is at producing income with a cap rate. And you can compare that to other things. Like what if you could go get a bond, you know, a, like a treasury bond or something, which, which basically has zero risk. You know, there's not a risk of default, it's passive, you're not having to do a lot of work like you are with a rental property. If you could get that at 3% and you're buying a property that's also at 3% as a cap rate, you know, maybe you, maybe you buy that property, but I would really have to start wondering to myself, I could buy a completely passive, no risk treasury bond for 3%, and I'm buying this rental property for 3%, I better have a really good reason to buy this rental property. Maybe I am. Maybe it's a great location and I feel very certain that it'll go up at 3 or 5 or 10% per year. Well, that's 
it could happen. It's a little bit speculative, but you, you at least need to answer that question for yourself because the first and foremost, the thing a rental property is, is there to do is produce income. And that's what this measures. A cap rate measures the ability to produce income. Now, that, but you might be saying, but wait a minute, Chad, when I buy rental properties, most of the time I do use a mortgage. I do use debt. So how is this relevant? Well, it's just, again, it's just the first step. It's one way of looking at it. And we have another formula that I want to share with you now that brings in the fact that you might use a mortgage and it helps you analyze the income from that standpoint. So this additional formula called the net income after financing, I see is a very good complement to the cap rate. I start with a cap rate. I want to know without any debt, how does this property do at producing income? But then we often do use debt, maybe you would too, to buy a property. And so you want to bring in the income after financing. So here's the basic formula on how that would work. You would take the net operating income, which we talked about with cap rate, but you can also see on an additional video, see the link above, I have a video on how to calculate net operating income. And you take that number and you subtract your financing cost. So for example, let's say you calculated that you have a duplex and that duplex on a monthly basis produces $1,200 per month in net operating income. So $1,200 per month. And you figure out that your mortgage payment is $800 per month. So that's gonna be going out of your pocket to pay your mortgage. So the difference between those two is just $400 per month. And that's your net income after financing. And you know, really when it comes down to it, this is one of the most important numbers because it basically tells you what you're gonna be putting in the bank. Of course, there, is some tax, there are some tax implications, which I'm not gonna get into this video. It's a little bit more complicated, but I will have some future videos to talk about net income after tax. But this is a pretty rough estimation because you have a lot of tax benefits like depreciation and things like that that help you shelter your income. It's a pretty good estimate of how much you're gonna be putting in the bank, $400 per month. And so some people use this as their primary goal. They might look at a property and say, okay, it's got uh, two doors, it's a duplex, that means it has two front doors, two units, and they might have a goal of having $200 per door in, in net income after financing. So you could do that and then you could run the numbers and say, if it doesn't have $200 per door, then I'm not gonna, not gonna do the property. If it's a house and you wanna make, just make sure you have $200 in cash or net income after financing per month, then you would just make sure that's your goal and you would just run the numbers. You would do this analysis on a very basic net operating income uh, estimate. You would be able to run your, and then estimate your financing costs, which by the way, there is a little bit more, another step to doing that. You can go to an amortization calculator online and do this very simply by, by just putting in the amount of the loan you're gonna be borrowing, the estimated interest rate, and it'll tell you the, the payments that you would have. And you can go to the one that I like to use a lot. I have a link. If you go to coachcarson.com forward slash amortization. I can spell that right. So coachcarson.com forward slash amortization. That'll take you to a really it's one I've used for years. I have no affiliation with that, but it's a calculator I like, and it'll help you figure out your mortgage payment or your financing costs. So that is the net income after financing. And I'm going to talk about one more formula that has to do with income called the cash on cash return. It's also very helpful to go along with this formula. All right, so this is the last of the formulas that I want to talk about with analyzing income for a property. And this is called a cash on cash return. And this is one that I would use to complement the cap rate and the net income after financing because it gives you an idea of what kind of return you're getting on your down payment or the amount of cash you have invested if you use financing. And so I just explained how to use net, how to calculate net income after financing. So the, for this one, you just need to figure out how much cash you put into the property. And I say down payment, but it might be in addition to the down payment you make when you purchase the property, it might include any other cash you have for repairs or you know, closing costs or things like that. So you want to make sure you include everything. But let me show you an example. So using the, the numbers we had from, that, from the last calculation, last formula, you had $400 per month and in net income after financing. So for a year, that's just 4,800 uh, 4, per year. And let's say that you had a $50,000 down payment. So remember, I do really approximate math with these. You don't have to be exact. You know, if I looked at that without a calculator, I would just say, you know, 10% of 50,000 is 5,000. This is a little bit less than that. So it's around a 10% return, a little bit less, a little bit less than 10% but around a 10% cash on cash 
return. Now, why is this valuable? This is valuable because you have to be disciplined with your cash. So when you invest the cash in a property, you at least just want to see how much of that cash am I getting back in year one. And that's really what this means. This means based on the numbers I have, if I put 50000 bucks in, I'm going to get about 10% of it back. And so you can compare that to other investments that you have. You could put it in the stock market and maybe you get an index fund that gets you 2% dividend rate. If that kind of thing is important to you, if the income return is important to you, then that is a good measure of it. The thing I'll say about cash on cash return, though, is it's kind of a tricky calculation because when you use leverage, it, it can sometimes not be as important as some of the other ones like cap rate and net income after financing. For example, let's say you, you got a very small amount of cash flow. You, know, you got $100 per month or $1,200 per year, $1,200 per year, but then you had a $1,000 uh, $1, down payment somehow. You know, you'd, or maybe maybe even a you know you got a, a FHA loan and you put a, a really small down payment and had a good good price on it. So you put three thousand down. Well, all of a sudden you have this incredible cash on cash return. This is all this is like greater than a thirty you know thirty three percent cash on cash return. And you might say, wow, that's incredible, thirty three percent. But these are really small numbers. Three thousand down, twelve hundred per year. I mean, what if you ended up getting three thousand dollars? per year in cash flow, you'd have a 100% return. Isn't that incredible? And that's the best deal ever. Well, maybe, maybe not, because you're magnifying your returns because you're using so much leverage, you're using a high amount of leverage. Now, there's nothing wrong if that's a good deal for you and that makes sense, but my point is, this is why you look at a lot of different formulas. You wanna use a cap rate, you wanna use net income after financing, and make sure that it works in multiple ways, not just a cash on cash return. But I do think it's a good one to bring into the mix as you try to have discipline for making sure you're actually getting a return on your cash. All right, so I spent a lot of time going over back of the envelope formulas for analyzing the income of a rental property. And I spent a lot of time because those are really the foundational pieces of an analysis. You know, we call it rental property for a reason because it produces rent. That's one of the main reasons we buy it. We can use that rent to put money in our bank account. We can use that rent to pay the debt. We can use that rent to to have it grow over time and make more rent, but that the point is that income is very important. But there, there are cases, and the reason I wanna give you another tool to also analyze along with those income formulas is that sometimes the income is not as good and it might not be the main reason we buy a deal. Like I like to get properties that produce both income and have some equity growth potential. But especially in a hot market, and some and sometimes even within any market, if you buy some of the higher quality properties, you know, it might not be a screamer of a deal just on your cap rate and net income after financing, that sort of thing. And so equity analysis is another thing that you need to understand and bring as a tool in your toolbox. And let me first of all define what equity means. It basically just means what you own. And the reason I have a balance sheet drawn here, this is a really important concept to understand, is that in any business and finance and investing, you have the same thing. You are, you are basically buying assets. So in our case, it's a rental property or a piece of property. You could be buying a stock or a CD or whatever, and it has a certain value. So you could think about like this, this, this column here is the value of that property. And to buy that property, you often use debt. So you have a liability. And then the difference between your asset and your liability, and that's actually the formula for figuring out your equity, is assets minus liabilities equals the amount of equity you have in a property or you have in, in any other ownership of other things. Really your net worth, that's, what's, that's when you calculate your net worth, that's just the total of all of your assets all together and you subtract all of your liabilities, and what's left over is your equity. And, in, and really in the end of the day, that's the game we're playing. We're trying to increase our equity and we're trying to get a larger net worth and that's how you build, that's what wealth building is all about. And when you get to a certain amount of wealth, you can then retire off of it. You can live off of it and have financial independence. So that's why this is an important concept to understand. And I want to mention when you're analyzing a deal, there are four basic ways to increase the equity that you have in a property. Because when you start off, you could think about a real simple example. If you bought a property for $100,000 and you put $20,000 down, you'd have an $80,000 loan or debt. So in that case, you're starting off, you're putting $20,000 into the property, right? That is your original equity day one. But how can we make that get bigger? That's what we want to do. We want to build wealth. 
And so these are the four ways you can do that. The first thing you can do, and the, I'm gonna say these first two are the most important when you're analyzing deals. These, sec, these third and fourth are important, but I like to usually kind of have those after the fact. Those are kind of gravy in addition to what I'm making here at the beginning. So the first thing you can do is you can buy a property at a discount. So this is the whole buy low, sell high. So if you can, because you're bringing cash to, the, to, to a, a property or you just find a situation where somebody just needs to unload it and sell it quickly, it's not unreasonable that you could get a 10% discount, a 20% discount, maybe even a 30 or percent or more discount. This is not like stocks where you have millions of people trying to, to buy properties or buy stocks. You, know, you are one sell, one buyer and there might, you might talk to a seller where it makes sense for both of you to work together and to buy a property. It might be because it's a bank and they just took it back at foreclosure and they don't want to do the work to maximize the value of this property. It might be because somebody inherited the property and they're out of town. It might be a, another situation, a divorce, foreclosure. You know, sometimes just life happens and people want to solve a problem. It could be a landlord who's just tired of the property. For whatever reason, it, it, it could happen, and it's happened a lot for me, that you can buy properties below its current value. So you can buy it at a discount. And by, by doing that, so you might buy a property for $100,000, $100, but the real value might be $120,000. So you put $20,000 down, but you also have, you have an additional $20,000 in equity. So you, just by negotiating, just by, by doing a good job asking and searching for properties, you turn that $20,000 into a total of $40,000. That's pretty good, right? You're making money when you buy. And so the way you can turn that into a to analysis, what do you, how do you look at that? You might say, all right, when I buy a property, I wanna make sure I get a, at least a 10% discount along with some of those other income formulas. So maybe I have a $200 per month goal to make in, in, in net income after financing, and I wanna get a 10% cash on cash return, and I wanna make sure I buy at least at a 10% discount. Or maybe you wanna be a little more aggressive. You've buy, been buying more properties and you're better at buying. Maybe you want a 20% discount. So that would be a way you can analyze a deal and buy, and buy it at a discount. But another way of looking at that, and this is often where I find my best deals, is it might not be on the surface. You might not be buying it below its current value right away. You might need to do something to it to force the appreciation so that the after repair value for it is, is higher than the current value. So a, a, a fixing, up, fixing up a property is the most common form of, of adding value to a property. You go in there and you add an extra bedroom to the property because you turn a dining room into a bedroom. And it costs you 5,000 bucks, but it increases the value of the property by 20,000 bucks, for example. That would be a way of adding value. If you buy multi-unit properties, just by increasing the rent maybe to the market rates or decreasing expenses on the property, you're adding value. So the, the, the value after you do those repairs could be another way of increasing your equity. You buy it for 100,000 bucks, but you do something to it, spend some money on it, and you increase your equity. So in both cases, you're, you're, do, you're controlling the profit, the amount of money you make on the property by increasing your equity. So I like to use those to analyze deals. These other two are also important. So when you own a long-term rental property, if you can just pay the mortgage down over time and have, if you have a 20-year loan and you're at least breaking even on that loan, you're going to be building equity month by month by month by paying down your mortgage. So it's definitely important. I don't necessarily always calculate that up front on this back of the envelope math, but it is definitely something you can make money on as a rental property. And then passive appreciation can make you very, very wealthy by buying in the right locations and just holding on. I don't use that necessarily as a back of the envelope analysis, although it could be a big part of my long-term wealth building plan because I wanna buy a property that meets a certain goal with income, that maybe meets a certain goal with equity. I buy it 10% below value or if it's in a really good location, really good property, I might not need to get a discount at all as long as the income and everything else works. So th this is how I use equity analysis to kind of complement the income of a property and, and be able to analyze a deal using back of an envelope or the back of a napkin or whatever the case might be. All right, I wanna put everything together that we've talked about here, both the income analysis and also the equity analysis and put it in a step-by-step -step approach that you can use today if you wanna go out and analyze a rental property. So the, the first step, or really the pre-step, is that you need to set some goals for yourself. So before you go and analyze a deal, you gotta know what you want. Remember, the property has a job to do. 
And so how is this job going to, how is this property going to do its job for you? And you can use multiple formulas. That's typically what I do. I use a cap rate. Uh, I use a net income after financing. And I usually use a discount to the value. So I use a few different ones to, to look at that. And you can also, use, if you want to get a cheat sheet that has all of these formulas in one place that you can basically carry around with you and use, be sure to either look above in the video or in the show description and the video description below for an analysis cheat sheet, and you'll be able to get that and download it for free. And it's just a one-page PDF that'll help you set some goals for what's important to you. But once you have that, you have those written down, right? And you go to step number one, just go out and find a property. You can find it, maybe you found one on Zillow, maybe someone sent you one, maybe your realtor sent you a list. But step one, of course, find a property to analyze. Number two is you want to gather some information. So with the in, from the income standpoint, you need to gather information on the rent and the expenses to be able to calculate what some of these other formulas are. And you can get approximate numbers to start off. As you get into more detail and you're making an offer on a property, you really want to check your assumptions and get even more detail. But my, my thoughts are earlier in the process you are, the more approximate you can get. Even to the point where, we, remember we calculated the, the net uh, operating income? Almost sometimes just use something like a 50% rule. Where I say, you know what? Approximately 50% of the rent is going to go to expenses. So I can figure out my net operating income really easily by just saying, all right, 50% of the rent equals a certain amount. Let's say it was $1,000. And then 50% of that, I would have $500 in expenses. So I have net operating income of $500. It's kind of small writing there. Sorry about that. But my point here is you're going to gather information on the rent and the expenses just approximately best you can so that you can then go to step number three and, and create a snapshot. That's an important term here. Because remember, you're just doing this on a piece of paper on an envelope. You're just trying to get a, a snapshot, like just almost like you're taking a quick picture of this deal at this point in time. And so the, the only thing you need to think about is, you know, which snapshot formulas you're going to use. I like to use the 1% rule early on in the analysis. So just kind of the first step of my income analysis. If I get past that, then I like to do definitely these middle two, the cap rate and the net income after financing. Sometimes I also run a cash on cash return. And so that snapshot is you just have a piece of paper and you would have the formulas and the things I just talked about here. And it took me you know, a while to explain all these, but it might take me two minutes to do these analysis. Maybe it takes me another few minutes to gather the, the rent and expenses if I'm not familiar with the area. And then I put those on a piece of paper and just have those sitting there next to each other. That's what a snapshot means to me on that envelope. The next thing I would do after doing the income analysis, that's what I always do, I then study some comparable sales. You want to look at what properties are selling for both in an as-is condition comparable to what you're looking at and maybe also in an after repair value. So that, that, that's something your realtor can also help you out with, your property manager, if you're not real familiar, if you're brand new. But with that information, I'm going to do a quick equity snapshot. So I either want to look at the current discount. So am I buying it for $100,000 and it's worth $120,000? So I have a $20,000 discount um, from the full price. Or maybe more commonly, um, you're buying it for 100 and you have to do something to it to make it worth the $120,000. Maybe you got to spend 5,000 bucks to get a $120,000 increase. So, but, but in any case, I want to know that I'm getting some kind of discount to the full value, either just by paying cash and closing quickly or by doing something to the property. So that is the process that, that I go through. And I do this all, you know, maybe you do use a little calculator on your, on your phone to do some of the basic math. Or as you get more practice at this, maybe you don't have to use a calculator at all, but this is a great first step to analyzing a deal. By the time you get done with this, you should know, is this really a good deal or is it not? You know, remember Warren Buffett's wisdom? If you have to use a calculator or a spreadsheet to tell you that it's a good deal, you probably shouldn't buy it. When you get done with this, you're going to be either excited or you're going to be like, eh, I'm not sure. And yeah, by all means, bring in a spreadsheet especially the bigger the property is, if you're doing a big multi-unit property with multi-million dollar you know, kind of numbers and you're gonna have to bring in partners and banks, you're gonna need a spreadsheet. But I, I'm willing to bet people, if Warren Buffett can buy $5 billion uh, company investments, we can buy some even a million dollar multi-unit property and still do back of the envelope analysis. As I close this, I just wanna remind you that if you wanna get that analysis cheat sheet, be sure to click it, look in the show, the description of the video below and you can get that cheat sheet. And if you like this video, you like other, you're gonna like other things that I have on the channel, be sure to click that subscribe button so you don't miss anything in the future. 
and share it with your friends, let other people know and leave a comment below and let me know what you think about the video. Do you have any questions on analysis, anything I can help you with, or is there anything that wasn't clear that I made in the video? I would love to hear from you. I'll respond to everybody in the comments. Really appreciate you watching the video. I look forward to seeing you next time.